Good afternoon. My name, uh, for those of you who don't know me, is Charles Livingston. I am a partner in the Government Regulation and Competition team at Brodie's, uh, and I uh, head up the competition part of that team. Uh, and as part of that remit, we are dealing with the National Security and Investment Act 2021. Uh, and that is the subject of this webinar and the question, are you ready for it coming into force? So the agenda for today, uh, I'll cover a little bit of the background to the Act, why it was introduced. Um, we'll then get into the Act itself, cover the mandatory notification rules, uh, the sectors that, uh, or at least some of the key sectors that are in scope of those rules. And we'll speak a little bit about the government's um, more general call-in power. Uh, and we'll talk about um, how uh, the government uh, suggests that it will assess national security risks for the purposes of the Act. And then, as I said, we will leave time for questions at the end. Um, so the first section um, is the background to the Act, um, and on the next slide I've set out uh, a little bit of the context, things that you will generally be familiar with, um, recent, uh, recent issues that have arisen in terms of uh, investments into the UK uh, that have raised national security concerns. So going back a little bit, we've got the Hinkley Point C nuclear power station where there was Chinese investment, um, there was uh, quite a lot of uh, review uh, reviews of that um, but ultimately it was given the go-ahead uh, and uh, reportedly that was at least in part because the government wasn't entirely sure that it had the power uh, to prevent that investment. Um, you will recall the story about Huawei's and it, Huawei and its involvement in the UK 5G network um, so it's to be removed from those networks by the end of 2027 after some protracted debate um, and then uh, Part of the background is also the, the COVID crisis. Um, so there were concerns about uh, the resilience of the UK's health emergency response capabilities and the, the sort of capabilities within the UK. Um, and also uh, there were reports and complaints of um, quote unquote aggressive acquisitions during the COVID crisis. So um, those are all um, background. In terms of the, the government's current powers, they're on the next slide. Um, the, the current intervention powers, and one of the reasons for the Act, is that the current powers are, are a little bit limited. So there are various grounds on which the government can currently intervene in relation to deals. Um, one of those, the, and the most used one, um, I believe, is uh, the interest of national security. Um, there are then various uh, sort of press and media um, grounds. Uh, and the, the government can also intervene in relation to the stability of the UK financial system, or since June of last year, they need to maintain the UK's capability to combat and mitigate public health emergencies. But one of the limitations of that regime is that it's limited to deals that trigger the merger control thresholds. Um, Recognising that over the last few years, there have been some reduced thresholds put in place for targets in uh, so-called sensitive sectors, and those have led to an uptick uh, in the number of interventions. Um, there's also a, a special regime for deals that involve UK-based current or former government contractors with confidential defence information. So again, that's uh, these, are all, these are all in the Enterprise Act regime, kind of tied in with the merger control um, regime. Um, on the next slide, uh, you will see, um, if we can move on, um, a couple of the limitations uh, of that regime. There's no mandatory notification. Um, there is a, a four month time limit to take action um, post uh, completion of the deal, uh, as long as the completion is made public, otherwise it's four months from the point it receives publicity. Um, but uh, more limited scope uh, for the government to both be aware of deals and then a more limited window to take action in respect to those deals. Um, the remedies are nevertheless pretty significant under the current regime. So uh, anticipated transactions can be blocked or completed deals can be unwound through forced divestment. That's at the sort of extreme end. Um, otherwise, and much like merger control, there are lesser remedies available, such as placing restrictions on the, the target and or the acquirer. Um, and we'll come back to uh, some examples of how those are being used that might be illustrative for the National Security and Investment Act going forward. Um, but we'll move on to the Act itself. Um, and on the next slide, there's uh, some of the key points in relation to that. Um, so it takes effect on the 4th of January uh, 2022. That is less than six weeks away. Um, so if you uh, are potentially within the scope of the Act, if you're handling a deal that might be within scope, uh, you're part of a business that's within scope and you want to understand its application, now is certainly the time 
to do that. Um, it creates a new freestanding framework to assess national security concerns. Um, national security will basically come out of the existing public interest intervention regime, um, and it will be dealt with through the Act instead. So there's a mandatory uh, pre-completion notification regime for key sectors with severe penalties for non-compliance, and I'll come back to talk about some of those. And there's also a government call-in power for deals that don't have to be proactively notified. Um, and that is uh, that power, although it can't be exercised until the 4th of January, um, it will be able to be exercised retrospectively in respect of deals uh, that completed any time from the 12th of November last year onwards. So deals completed in the last year and a bit or in the next five weeks and a bit um, will still be within the scope of the Act uh, and we'll, we'll see what the government makes of that. Um, but to start with, uh, we'll move on and we'll cover the mandatory notification uh, rules. So the, the scope of this regime it is a pre-completion um, or it imposes, sorry, a pre-completion uh, mandatory obligation to notify uh, deals that take place in 17 key sectors uh, in relation to targets within those sectors that meet the definitions that have uh, just last week um, been finally set out in regulations um, and uh, also supplemented by guidance issued by the UK government. Um, so that is, there is a mandatory obligation to notify uh, and that obligation extends uh, to not completing uh, until you have the result of that notification. Um, in terms of uh, the deals that are within scope, we'll come back to the sectors themselves, but in terms of the, the thresholds, um, the, the notification regime will attach to the acquisition of a right or interest conferring control of a what's called a qualifying entity that falls within the definitions in the 17 sectors. And a qualifying entity is essentially any entity that is not an individual, uh, regardless of whether it's a legal person. So it might be a company or an LLP or a limited partnership or a partnership or an un, even an unincorporated association. Um, any, any entity that's not an individual, the Act creates a very broad leeway in respect of these sorts of definitions. Um, if it carries on activities in the UK uh, or supplies goods or services to persons in the UK. Um, there's then the question of what does it mean to uh, acquire a right or interest that confers control? Um, well, there will be a, a, a conferring of control each time uh, a person passes one of the thresholds that are set out in the Act. And these are thresholds of shares or voting rights, uh, or if it's not a company, uh, a percentage entitlement to capital profits of the entity involved. If it's an LLP, it's an entitlement to um, the surplus uh, assets of the LLP on winding up. Um, and essentially anybody, uh, anytime anybody crosses one of these thresholds, they have to notify. So uh, anytime you uh, acquire more than 25%, you have to notify. If you then go over 50%, you have to notify again. And then if you go over 75%, you have to notify again. So a person might might not hold anything in a business, come straight in at the top of that um, 80%, let's say, um, and uh, have to notify. Um, or somebody may have 20%, increase that to 30, they have to notify, increase to 60, they have to notify, increase to 90, they have to notify each time. Um, alternatively, uh, from those thresholds, if a person acquires um, voting rights that allow them to secure the passage of or block any class of resolution um, proposed by the entity, then that will qualify uh, as, as an acquisition of control. So the, the thresholds are the sort of the easy to grasp numbers, um, but there is also that secondary consideration of whether um, the acquirer can secure or block any class of resolution. If they can, they will have acquired control for the purposes of the act. So in the next slide, there are some points to note in relation to these tests. There is no de minimis threshold in relation to the Act. And, and that's the case for the target's turnover, and it's the case for the deal value. So it doesn't necessarily matter how big or how small um, the target is uh, or how significant the deal is. It's very much focused on, on the nature of the target um, without uh, turnover or deal value really playing much of a part. Um, although there are there are particular sectors where the definitions incorporate a turnover element and uh, we may come back to some of those. Um, the target doesn't need to be a UK registered entity for the Act to apply. Um, it doesn't even need to be physically present in the UK. 
um, it just needs to be uh, involved in activities carried on in the UK or in uh, the supply of goods or services to persons in the UK. And the government has produced guidance on the application of the Act to non-UK acquisitions. And the, the term that that guidance uses is uh, really whether the business has sufficient involvement in, in, in activities or in the supply of goods or services um, to be said that it is involved in the carrying on of those activities or, or those supplies. Um, so there is room for uh, dispute there, I think, and we will uh, in due course, no doubt, get some clarity on that, um, probably from the courts. Um, no distinction is made in the Act between foreign and UK buyers. Uh, this, uh, this Act kind of internationally would fall within the concept of foreign direct investment controls, because that's how most of these sorts of regimes are set up in other countries. They do have uh, an element where um, it's only triggered if it's foreign ownership. Not the case here. So um, people should not have in their heads that this is only about foreign purchases. Um, we'll come back to uh, what sort of uh, acquirers might be more likely to raise issues. But for mandatory notification purposes, you disregard that question entirely. Um, it may be that if you're a UK buyer, um, that makes it more likely that after you notify, it will just be waved through. Um, but the requirement to notify, uh, that is not a relevant consideration for that stage of the exercise. Um, indeed, there is not actually a need to have a change of ultimate ownership at all. Uh, so internal corporate group reorganizations will be caught if within that group, um, there is an entity that qualifies um, for the mandatory notification regime under the Act. If its ownership changes um, and uh, or, or if its control changes by reference to the thresholds that we've discussed, um, then that will need to be notified. Again, if, it's, if there's no change of ownership and it's an internal reorganization, likely to be waived through, um, but uh, does need to be notified. Um, and uh, just from a practical perspective, it's worth noting that the government estimated 1,000 to 1,800 mandatory filings per year under this regime. That's what they were expecting they would have to field. Um, I've heard quite a lot of uh, commentary to the effect that that may be an underestimate. Um, it's worth pointing out that that estimate was produced when uh, originally the, the bottom threshold for acquiring control was 15% of shares or voting rights, etc. cetera. Um, that was removed in parliament. Um, so, so it, it may be that, uh, the, that that figure turns out to be an overestimate, but from some of the discussions I've heard, um, I think the government is going to be very, very busy uh, come the 4th of January. Um, so we'll move on to the 17 key sectors, um, which are set out in a table on this slide. Um, I will unpack some of them. Uh, some of them are relatively self-explanatory. Uh, so um, if you're involved in military and dual use technologies, for example, or if you use AI or quantum technologies. Those are the sorts of things that um, targets and sellers and buyers are fairly likely to, to know about. Um, and while you, you obviously have to go into the definitions and some of the definitions are quite complex, um, ultimately it's not, it's not too much of a head scratcher to at least be able to know for a particular target that you need to check it against the category. Um, there are others that are a little bit more uh, uncertain, um, and I'll unpack some of those, um, but uh, it's just worth noting for the purposes of this slide, so the, um, the sectors that have an asterisk against them, those are the ones that are currently uh, within the scope of the public interest intervention regime that I mentioned earlier. Those are the ones where there's a, a lower uh, merger control threshold has been put in place in order to provide a gateway into the public interest uh, regime. Um, but our, our list in full is advanced materials, advanced robotics, AI, civil nuclear, uh, communications, computing hardware, critical suppliers to government, cryptographic authentication, data infrastructure, defense, obviously, uh, energy, engineering, biology, military and dual use tech, quantum tech, satellite and space tech, uh, suppliers to the emergency services, and transport. Um, so we'll move on and I'll unpack some of those ones that uh, maybe uh, are, if you just look at the, the wording of the sector, are pretty broad and might cause the most head scratching among people as to whether or not they're caught. So communications, um, the, the kind of the foundational connection 
uh, for the purposes of whether a target is caught under this sector um, is uh, the concept of public communications networks and services. And what it essentially what it means for the, for those to be public is that members of the public are customers of that network or service. Um, so communications networks that are not uh, available to the public that do not have members of the public as their customers are not caught under this sector. Um, I mentioned earlier that some of the sector definitions have a turnover test built in. Uh, this is one of those. So the network or service in question has to have a turnover of at least 50 million pounds. Now you may be thinking so far so simple, um, pretty obvious to know whether a target uh, is a provider of a public communications network or service. Um, but it does get more complicated because the, sec uh, the sector definition brings in the providers of what are called associated facilities. Um, and that might be physical infrastructure like mass and data centers. It can be um, software, uh, more intangible uh, support and infrastructure. Um, those will be caught if they are related to a public communications network or service and related to means sort of assisting in its functioning or its provision or enabling people to use it. Um, it also covers entities that are involved in the repair or maintenance of submarine cables and landing stations, um, which is very, very specific. Um, and it also covers various digital infrastructure services. So um, there are various categories in relation to things like the provision of domain names and internet exchange points. Um, there is, uh, particularly in relation to that associated facilities point, a distinction between active and passive infrastructure that hopefully makes things a little bit simpler for at least some businesses. Um, so the, the scope excludes passive infrastructure manufacturers and suppliers, so for example, producers of ducts and poles, uh, things that are, are used to uh, facilitate the provision of a network but don't don't actually do anything and could uh, be used for other purposes as well. Um, and buildings uh, are excluded from the scope unless the main purpose of the building is to host an active network element. So for example, a data center, um, the building itself would be caught as an associated facility. And so if somebody was buying a person that owned a data center, um, then they would have to notify that. Um, on the next slide, we have critical suppliers to government, um, a, a pretty vague term. Um, but relatively, with one exception, relatively uh, straightforward to, to work out if you're looking at it. Um, the, the caveat to that is the definition of government. What does it mean um, to, to be a supplier to government? Um, well, it's uh, expressly said to mirror the definition of contracting authorities in the Public Contracts Regulations 2015. Um, so if, uh, if the target has a contract with somebody who has procured that contract under the public procurement regime, that will be a pretty good clue that they have a contract with a government body. Um, that can be, uh, the concept of contracting authorities can be tricky in relation to things like um, publicly owned uh, companies and businesses. Um, so that, that may be an area where, there, uh, where questions will need to be asked in relation to particular deals. Um, so the, the qualifying entity, the target, has to be a party to a contract with a government body. That's the sort of first level uh, of the scope of this uh, category. Um, being a subcontractor in a chain of contracts um, will not get you caught under this category, nor will being an indirect supplier to government. So uh, if, you're, if you're further up the supply chain than the immediate supplier, you will not be caught by this sector. Um, then uh, obviously there are lots of people that have contracts with government bodies. Um, so this, the, uh, the definition narrows it down so that the contract in question has to, has to feature um, or require um, the processing and or storage of material being classed secret or top secret, or it needs to require the entity to have list X accreditation or a requirement for employees to be vetted at or above security check level. So most contracts with most uh, government bodies are not going to be caught um, because they will not feature, they will not have those features. Um, but if a target has a contract with a government body that has any of those features, um, then uh, that uh, any acquisition 
of that entity will need to be notified under the mandatory regime. Um, and just for any of, uh, any of you who've been paying attention to the development of the regime, um, you may have uh, somewhere in the back of your mind the idea that uh, this category included the provision of physical or digital security to public authorities. That has been removed since the original draft uh, definition was published. So critical suppliers to government is now a more narrowly uh, focused um, category than it was previously. As moving on to defence, um, it's a broad definition, as you'd probably expect. So um, if you're involved in defence, it's activities that comprise or include uh, research, development, design, production, creation or application of goods or services used or provided for defence or national security purposes. Uh, and, a, and a target will then be caught, um, a target that does those things will be caught if it is either a government contractor, so direct contractor, or a subcontractor. So this category is different from critical suppliers to government. It includes people uh, further uh, further along the supply chain. Um, and it will also catch uh, any entities that have been notified by the government that they hold or may come into the possession of classified material um, as part of a contractual relationship. Um, one, uh, one aspect of this uh, that, that may cause um, particular difficulty is that there's no safe harbour exemption for a business that doesn't know it's making supplies for a defence related use. So you can imagine that there may be subcontractors who are quite a way down the chain uh, from the actual government contractor who don't actually know where their goods or services end up. Um, that is uh, That might look a bit like an oversight, but actually the government guidance uh, relies quite strongly on that principle. Um, uh, and it's on the principle that they want to have uh, visibility of the supply chains used for the purposes of defence, um, and it's not uh, it's not really a response to that to say that a particular participant in that supply chain doesn't know. Um, now, obviously, it's maybe a bit unreasonable uh, to be a bit unreasonable to punish somebody who uh, acquired a business and they had no idea that they were um, that they were involved in that defence supply chain. Um, so there may be leniency there, but in terms of the application of the mandatory notification regime, that's that's kind of black black and white. You're either caught or you're not, and if you're if you're caught, then you do have to notify. Um, it will uh, this category will also catch contracts that provide access to defence facilities, so cleaning companies and catering companies um, that have contracts to uh, that involve access to defence facilities. Um, any acquisition of those companies will have to be notified under this defence category. Um, so our next category is energy, and I'll split that into its component parts a little bit. Um, so uh, it covers electricity. Um, retail electricity suppliers are not within scope, so that that takes out quite a lot of what you might think of as the electricity sector. The businesses that are within scope are holders of transmission, distribution, or interconnector licences, um, or who have been granted an exemption from the need to have a license under the Electricity Act. Um, and and uh, again, that's going to be something that's that's documented. Um, the license or the exemption exists, so it's not, it's, it shouldn't be left to guesswork. Um, the category will also catch the owners or operators um, of any individual generating asset that has uh, or, or would have, so it includes prospectively if something's in development a total installed capacity of at least 100 megawatts. Uh, or alternatively, um, assets, uh, it, an owner or operator of assets that if they were cumulated with those of the acquirer and any entities that are related to the acquirer would result in the acquirer having a total installed capacity of at least one gigawatt. Um, so the, the target might have more than that by itself, in which case it has to, be no, it has to notify, the deal has to be notified, um, or it may be that the target plus the acquirer get you over that threshold, uh, in which case the deal has to be notified. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, aggregators, uh, so people who take electricity from different sources and then sell it into the market, um, that control um, assets within Great Britain that have a capacity of at least one gigawatt. Uh, and again, that's accumulated figure, target plus acquirer, if relevant. Um, then they will also be caught. So any any purchase of them uh, will have to be notified. Um, the other parts of the energy definition relate to oil and gas, which is on our next slide. Um, 
So the notification regime applies to the owner or operator of an upstream petroleum facility, uh, the throughput of 3 million tonnes of oil equivalent over the 12 calendar months prior to deal completion. Um, so uh, an upstream petroleum facility is a terminal pipeline or unit of infrastructure that is or will be necessary to a petroleum production project and that that's language taken from uh, from oil and gas legislation so again uh, there should be uh, certainty as to whether somebody is involved in a petroleum production project or not because there should be licenses and things like that that will confirm it um, the holder of a petroleum license in respect of an upstream petroleum facility uh, will be caught so even if they're not the owner or operator if they're the holder of the license they will uh, any acquisition of them will have to be notified um, and it also covers prospective facilities. So if a facility hasn't yet been constructed, um, the notification requirement will still apply uh, to the prospective owner or operator who's developing it or enabling its development. Um, that's subject again to that 3 million uh, tonnes of oil equivalent threshold. But for a prospective facility, that refers to the expected throughput in the first year of its operations. Um, and uh, a, a point that came out in the course of uh, drafting the regulations is that the facility uh, will be caught if it is situated in whole or in part in the UK, or just if it's used in connection with the supply of petroleum to persons in the UK. So that is potentially pretty broad um, and uh, potentially quite significant uh, extraterritorial application. Um, and we'll need to see uh, how that plays out in practice. Um, the next slide, uh, just sticking with oil and gas um, to finish that off. Um, an entity that's involved in the supply of petroleum based road, aviation, or heating fuels, including LPG, to persons in the UK will be uh, caught by the notification regime um, if the target uh, does the various things set out in the bullet. So, imports or stores crude oil, imports, stores, or produces intermediates, components, or finished fuels, or if it distributes fuels to storage sites or if it delivers fuels to retail airports or end users. So it's really the entirety of the supply chain there. Um, but that's subject to the caveat that the entity has to uh, have capacity of more than 500,000 tonnes of oil, uh, or needs to own an individual UK facility that has a capacity of greater than 50,000 tonnes. Um, and you can determine that capacity by reference to the, the amount that was handled by the facility in any one of the three calendar years prior to completion. So it doesn't necessarily need to be um, consistently handling those volumes. If it's handled it in any year, uh, handled them in any year prior to completion, then it will be caught. Um, again, there, there are uh, entities caught if they hold particular licenses. So in relation to gas transmission, distribution, interconnector licenses or exemptions under the gas legislation, um, shouldn't be too much difficulty working that out. Um, and gas processing facilities, uh, owners and operators of those are caught as well if they're located in Great Britain and have the technological capacity to process more than 6 million cubic metres of gas per day. Uh, and also added uh, in the course of um, the regulations being produced, so it wasn't in the first draft, but is in the final draft, um, owners or operators of uh, an LNG import or export facility as a technological capacity to carry on the importation, regasification, or liquefaction of more than 6 million cubic meters of gas per day. So you can see there's sort of lots of stages of the supply chain um, in relation to oil and gas uh, that, will be, that will be caught here. Um, and in, in most cases within that supply chain is gonna come down to the question of whether the thresholds are met. Um, so we'll move on to uh, transport, our final sector. Um, this one's relatively straightforward. Um, the name of the sector suggests it's very wide, um, but actually the definitions are pretty narrow. So it covers any entity that owns or operates a port or harbour that handles at least 1 million tonnes of cargo in the preceding year. And that essentially matches the definition uh, used to identify um, the, the UK's major ports. Um, so Again, if, if you're buying one of those, you, you will probably not be in much doubt that that's what you're buying. Um, there were uh, attempts uh, in consultation responses um, to qualify that by reference to passenger capacity uh, or by reference to particularly sensitive goods being transported, um, but the, the government rejected those entreaties. Um, it will, uh, the, the notification requirement will also apply to the owners or operators 
of terminals, wharves, and other infrastructure within those major ports. So it's not necessarily just the ports themselves. Um, any entity that owns or operates an airport that handles at least 6 million passenger movements or 100,000 tonnes of freight uh, will be caught. Um, and if it's acquired, that will have to be notified. Um, the, the reference year for those figures is 2018, because obviously there were um, significant reductions in those numbers um, during COVID. Um, so it, we, we will see uh, how long it takes um, for the some of the airports that were doing those numbers in 2018 to get back to them. But ultimately, the question is going to be, were they doing those numbers in 2018? Um, and operating a, an airport means having overall responsibility for its management. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't cover things like ground handling uh, operators who are, who are sort of doing some of the nuts and bolts of making the airport work. Um, and uh, the, the last um, type of entity within this category that would be caught uh, by the mandatory notification regime is a provider or owner of a provider of en route air traffic control services in the UK. So any acquisition of somebody that does that uh, would need to be notified. Um, so that's our uh, coverage of some of the key sectors. Uh, if you want to ask about um, other sectors, just pop a question in the Q&A. Um, I can't promise I'll necessarily be able to answer. Some of them are pretty difficult to unpack, um, but I would uh, certainly give it a go. Um, so we've covered the deals that are within scope. Um, Essentially, what, what happens if your deal is within scope? What's the procedure and timings? Um, so regulations have been published, again, just, just last week. So I would like to thank the government for its perfect timing um, for this webinar, uh, giving me um, a matter of days to uh, bone up on all these issues. Um, so regulations prescribe the content of what needs to go into a mandatory notice. And that requires significant information about the target, about its pre and post completion ownership, and its relevant activities, by which I mean the activities that have resulted in it having to be notified. Um, and it also, uh, the notice will require a, a fair amount of information, as you'd expect, about the acquirer, including any non-UK government ownership or control or influence over the acquirer, um, and also information about each of its shareholders and directors. Um, the next bullet point begins once accepted. And I think this is the key there's quite a key point here. Um, the, the investment security unit, which is the unit within the business department that is going to deal with notifications, um, will essentially, when it receives a notice, will essentially have a discretion to decide whether that notice uh, contains all the information that it needs to contain. That's very much like the merger control process in the UK, uh, where the CMA uh, receives a notice and essentially uh, takes its time going through the notice, asking further questions, making sure it's got all the information it wants from the parties, and only then will it start its statutory clock. So um, the, the mandatory notification regime is similar in that it has statutory deadlines, but the government is going to be entirely in control of when those, when those deadlines actually start, when the clock actually begins to run. Um, so if you're, if you're looking at a deal and you're trying to sort of game out the timings, it's very important that you keep that in mind and you don't assume that your 30 working days start from the day you submit the notice because that's that's very unlikely to be what happens. Um, but once the ISU has decided that it has what it needs, um, it then has 30 working days to carry out a sort of initial uh, screening process um, to decide whether to issue a call-in notice, which commences the, the next more formal, more in-depth part of the review, or alternatively to confirm that no further action will be taken. Um, if it gives a call-in notice, then it, there is a further initial assessment period. So you have your first screening period of 30 working days, then you move to your initial assessment period of 30 working days. Um, that can be extended uh, by 45 working days if the Secretary of State gives notice to that effect, um, which can be done if the Secretary reasonably believes there's a national security risk and more time is needed to evaluate it. Um, and you can also, the parties can agree a further voluntary period, um, which, which you might do, um, you know, you're probably asking yourself, why would, why would any party agree to that? Um, well, you might do that uh, if you think uh, the government will um, refuse to clear the deal if it's not happy that it has enough time to consider it. But if it has more time to get its head around it, then it may clear it. Um, so the parties are able to agree 
um, an extension of that time. Um, and again, as with merger control, there are stop the clock provisions. So if they think they need more information from the parties, then they can stop the clock running um, while they await that. Um, on the next slide, we've got outcomes and penalties. So if you get into a call-in procedure, you have basically two potential outcomes. A final notification, which actually, which sounds ominous, um, but actually just means it's confirmation that no further action will be taken. Or a final order, which is what will be produced um, if uh, the government is satisfied that a risk to national security arises. Um, and, and a final order can impose a wide range of requirements to remedy the issue. So um, could uh, could block the deal entirely if the deal's already completed, which it shouldn't have done um, if it's covered by mandatory notification, um, then it can uh, require divestment. Um, short of that, uh, they can impose um, conditions on what the what the acquirer can do with the target and how the target operates. And we'll come back to some examples of that from the current regime. Um, one, one point that's interesting uh, in the uh, Act is that the government can provide financial assistance to an entity in consequence of it having issued a final order. Um, that does not have an equivalent in merger control or other regimes. Um, I suppose the thinking is that if the government is imposing national security requirements on a company, um, then uh, you know the company doesn't exist for for the purposes of serving national security, and so it's not fair for the company uh, to be the the only uh, bearer of the additional costs. Um, so since it's in the state's interest for the company to comply, then it's appropriate for the state to provide. Uh, compensation for the costs of complying. I suppose that's the thinking behind that. Um, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see how often that's actually used. Um, in terms of the the consequences of failing to notify, if a deal is notifiable, it you know meets the various thresholds. It meets the definitions within one of the one or more of the sectors. Um, if it completes without approval, um, then uh, that acquisition will be void. Um, that's the word that the legislation uses. It's not clear exactly what that will mean in practice. Um, it, it must mean that uh, the, uh, the deal um, providing for control to change is legally unenforceable. Um, but is it, is it, will that change be treated um, if, uh, as having never happened, even if the parties were to proceed on the basis that it had happened? Um, I think that probably must be the case, um, but again, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, it's the it's the acquisition, it's the change of control that's deemed to be void. Um, so uh, the underlying contracts themselves may survive, in which case uh, the buyer might be able to rely on indemnities or warranties given by the seller. If the seller says that what you're buying is not is not subject to mandatory notification under the Act, but it turns out that it was subject to mandatory notification, then that is going to come at a cost to the buyer. Um, as long as the as long as the deal documents themselves are not void, um, then uh, the buyer may be able to rely on things like indemnities. Um, so again, we'll, we will see, I think, a practice develop around that, um, and and no doubt at some point that will come to a dispute and that question will be resolved. Um, if a deal has completed without approval. It is possible to validate it retrospectively. So to ask the government um, or to sort of say hands up to the government, this went through, should have been notified. It wasn't. Can you validate it? Um, if the government does so, um, and there's a there's a whole process uh, like the submission of a mandatory notice, but there's a whole process for um, submitting a validation notice. If the government approves that, then uh, the the effect of the act on the deal will will essentially be waived. And the deal will be treated as having had gone, having as having gone through. Um, that may be something that comes up uh, in in the slightly more medium to long term. So that if you have a if you have a change of control of an entity that should have been notified but isn't, that may go unnoticed or nobody nobody may care for a while until somebody else comes to buy uh, or possibly just invest in that entity. Um, at which point the question is asked, did you notify your acquisition of this business? If the answer is no, 
well, it turns out you don't own this business. Um, so you're going to have to get this validated in order for you to own it before you can sell it to us. So in, to some extent, it almost becomes like the sort of title investigation you do for a house. Um, you know, you check that the person purporting to sell the house is the person that actually has title to the house. Um, so kind of adding a, another um, or, or a new uh, level or line of due diligence um, to corporate transactions. Um, if a notifiable deal is completed without approval, then uh, the the entities themselves and also any directors or management involved in uh, the decision to do so can potentially face uh, criminal sanctions, a uh, maximum of five years in prison or an unlimited fine, uh, or alternatively can be made subject to civil penalties. Uh, and that's the, uh, the maximum there is the higher of 5% uh, of global group turnover. So that's, again, we're kind of drawing parallels with the competition regime there and you, that you look at these things on a group basis. Uh, or if it's if more than that 5% figure, 10 million pounds. Um, so we're, we're talking some pretty big disincentives there. Um, should note that uh, these sanctions are only available if, if uh, there's been a, a failure to notify and there's no reasonable excuse for that failure. So if we think about that situation where the, the buyer doesn't necessarily know everything that the target does and the seller has assured them that it's not notifiable, then that may constitute a reasonable excuse. Um, but that's I think that's something where uh, having an audit trail of the analysis that's been done in relation to the National Security and Investment Act um, will, will potentially be quite important uh, in the longer term for those involved. Um, so leaving behind the mandatory notification regime uh, for now, I will move on to the call-in regime. Um, and on the next slide, we set out the scope of that. So um, leaving aside the deals that have to be notified, the government also has a very wide ranging power to call in for review, essentially any deal uh, where a person gains control of a uh, qualifying entity, um, and that's as defined before, um, or a qualifying asset. Uh, and, and that gaining of control is described as a trigger event. Um, and, and the Secretary of State can call that in if they think that the deal could create a national security risk. Um, so a qualifying entity is, is, as we've already defined, control of a qualifying entity is also uh, as we've already defined it. So your 25, 50, 75 percent thresholds, your passage or blocking of a resolution. But for this power, not for the mandatory notification, but for this power, there's also uh, the ability um, for the government to look at it if the acquisition results in somebody acquiring material influence over the policy of the target. Um, and that can be acquired without necessarily being able to veto or uh, pass a resolution. It can be acquired without crossing even a 25% share threshold. Um, it might be acquired, for example, somebody has 26% of shares and goes to 49% of shares. They've not crossed the threshold, but they might have secured material influence um, over how the business operates. Material influence is actually a concept that already exists in UK merger control. Um, the UK government guidance on its exercise of the call-in regime refers across to the CMA's guidance um, for the merger control regime. Um, so there, there's, unlike a lot of the other concepts in the National Security and Investment Act, there's actually a, a, a fair amount um, of, uh, of, of backstory, of precedent uh, that we can rely on in relation to establishing whether material influence exists. Um, but notwithstanding that, it is still a, a bit of a woolier concept um, than the the certainty you have when you cross a threshold of shares or voting rights or where you um, know that you've secured the ability to block resolutions. Um, so the call-in regime uh, may well be exercised um, in scenarios where the mandatory notification regime wouldn't be available because the, the levels of control are slightly different. Um, I've said that it, it applies to uh, asset deals as well as uh, deals for entities. Assets defined very, very broadly, um, again, so, so broadly that it seems unlikely anything would fall outside it. Um, so it will include uh, land, for example, land that overlooks a sensitive Ministry of Defense site might be covered. It'll cover corporeal, corporeal movable property, um, or it'll cover uh, what's described in the act as ideas, information, or techniques which have industrial, commercial, or other economic value. 
Um, and examples given are trade secrets, databases, formulae, design software, etc. Um, so intellectual property um, possibly going a little bit wider than what you would normally understand as the concept of IP. Um, so you have those, those three categories, and then the asset has to be used in connection with activities in the UK uh, or for the supply of goods and services to the UK. Um, so again, as before, you could very much be looking at non-UK assets here, um, might, be, uh, might be IP um, that is uh, used for defence purposes in the UK, uh, despite the, the holder of the IP um, being based uh, somewhere else and having absolutely no connection uh, with the UK, other than the fact that its IP is used to supply goods or services. Um, and in terms of control for an asset, what you're looking at there is acquiring a right or interest in or in relation to the asset that allows the person to use the asset or to direct or control how it's used. Um, and that includes uh, increasing an existing ability to use or control the asset. Um, we are going to say more about um, the application of the Act to assets in another webinar we're doing next week, which is going to focus on IP. Uh, and I'll come back to some of the details uh, of that at the end. Um, so we'll move on to the timings of the call-in regime. Um, so in this scenario, the Secretary of State can issue a call-in notice without the deal ever having been notified. Um, and such a notice can be given within six months of the Secretary of State becoming aware of the, the trigger event, the acquisition of control over the relevant entity or asset. Um, if, the, if the Secretary of State uh, has not become aware of it, um, so let's let's say the deal takes place um, and then uh, two years later, um, it's still never been publicized. There is a long stop timing of five years for the issuing of a call-in notice after the trigger event. Um, so that's that's really long. Um, I mean, that's uh, that's that's going a long time. And it's obviously it's intended as an anti-avoidance provision. So people don't just uh, commit to a deal, then stay quiet for five years. Um, and then there's nothing the government can do, um, particularly in relation to a mandatory, uh, mandatory notification uh, deal. If a deal is covered by mandatory notification, there is no time limit. Um, if you fail to notify it, um, there is no, no limit on the Secretary of State's ability to call in that deal and review it. Um, and I mentioned at the start that this, this call-in power, um, which, which we might call an, an own initiative power, the power to uh, commence a review of its own initiative. Uh, that would, again, be the parallel with how we describe these things when the CMA does it in a merger control perspective. Um, deals that complete from, uh, that have completed from the 12th of November 2020 or that complete between now and the Act coming into force, um, the timeline for the Secretary of State to call those in will be six months from the day the call-in power comes into force, meaning 4th of January. Um, if the Secretary of State has already become aware of the deal before that, uh, or the long stop of five years from that day. Um, so uh, again, there's no, there's no ability to sort of see out that six month clock by keeping it quiet because you, you still have the full five years to run um, before the call-in uh, call power would become unavailable. Um, the procedure on the next slide um, under the call-in regime uh, pretty much any of the parties involved can notify the Secretary of State of a deal that's not covered by mandatory notification. Um, the uh, regulations that prescribe the content of a mandatory notice also set out what needs to go into a voluntary notice. Um, and again, it's, uh, it's, it's the same process uh, once you are into, um, once, once you've filed that voluntary notice, uh, the ISU can decide whether or not to accept it. If it does accept it, it has a 30 working day screening process. Um, to give a call in uh, and can then give a call in notice or confirm no further action. Um, deals can be notified pre or post completion. The real value of notifying on a voluntary basis is for the buyer to do that to avoid the risk of it being called in afterwards. Again, shades of merger control. Um, and then if a call in notice is given um, either own initiative or based on a voluntary notification, then you're back into the same process as apply under mandatory notification. It's basically different ways into the same process. Um, but but if the mandatory notification regime doesn't apply, then you're not looking at criminal offences, civil fines, etc. Um, the government will have the power to impose interim orders, so hold separate requirements, again, mirroring merger control. Um, if they are reviewing a deal, 
and it's completed, they can impose orders uh, requiring that the businesses be kept separate, uh, or indeed, or indeed, they can issue an order requiring that uh, the deal not complete if it hasn't completed already. Um, okay, so moving on to how the government is going to assess risk. Um, the, the government has published a statement, as it has to do under the Act, on how it expects to use the call-in power. Uh, and this, these principles apply whether um, it's, it's using that power from its own initiative or following a mandatory notification. Um, it notes that uh, it's most likely to use its own initiative power uh, in the 17 key sectors to which mandatory notification applies. Um, obviously, if uh, if the deal is subject to mandatory notification, then then this is redundant. But um, if you're within those sectors, but you don't you don't hit the thresholds for control, um, but you do have material influence, then the government might call it in on that basis. Similarly, entities that are not uh, are not within the definitions but are closely linked to the sort of activities that are covered in those sectors, then uh, that's a higher risk of being called in. Um, if it's an asset deal, mandatory notification can't apply, um, but the government may call that in if the asset is used in or is closely linked to those sectors. Um, and what's what's useful is that the guidance says that uh, if there isn't a connection with those 17 sectors, then a call-in is uh, quote unquote unlikely. Now, you can't exactly take that to the bank, but it at least provides some comfort that um, that the government is, is looking at this call-in, uh, this own initiative power, more to buttress the mandatory notification power in the, in the same uh, field of application, rather than looking to go off in lots of other directions, calling in things um, that have no connection with the, the 17 key sectors. Um, the guidance does note that non-UK entities and assets are less likely to create risk to UK national security, so are less likely to be called in. But I mean, that, that's really qualified by reference to the strength of the connection with the UK. Um, so on the next slide, uh, we set out the three types of risk that the government has identified. Um, one is target risk, the entity or asset is or could be used in a way that raises a risk to UK national security, most obviously a defence contractor or a nuclear power plant or something like that. Um, acquirer risk, so the identity or characteristics of the acquirer would give rise to concerns. Um, and there the government would be looking at, the, the, the statement says the government would be looking at its current activities and holdings, its capabilities, and its links to hostile or criminal entities. Um, the guidance says that if the uh, acquirer has a history of passive or long-term investments, then they're less likely to be interested in that. Um, the, the guidance says that state-owned entities, sovereign wealth funds, or other entities affiliated with foreign states are not inherently more likely to pose a national security risk. Um, but obviously there are there's quite a lot there where one can read between the lines. Um, so Norway's sovereign wealth fund uh, will will probably be uh, treated with far less suspicion than the sovereign wealth fund of uh, countries that are um, that are not allies of the UK and that indeed may be hostile to the UK. Um, and the guidance says that there will be no judgments based solely on country of origin. But I think I think we can assume that country of origin is going to be fairly relevant here. Um, the third type of risk is control risk, and that arises from the type and level of control being acquired and how it could be used in practice. So the guidance uh, states or gives the example of loans, conditional acquisitions, futures and options being the type of control that are unlikely to pose a risk. Um, but the most basic illustration is that total or majority control over an entity or, or an asset is more likely, inherently more likely to create risk than just having a minority interest. Um, so the government will look at these three risks together. It's not a case of sort of tick one box and you're caught. Um, it's, uh, it, it'll look at all three of them together um, and take a, a sort of holistic view, but um, this is at least helpful in knowing uh, what sorts of things they are most likely to prioritize. Um, so I'll just finish off with uh, some case studies from the current um, national uh, public interest intervention regime uh, where things have been, uh, where there have been interventions on national security grounds. Just as an illustration of the sorts of uh, deals that might attract attention and the, and, and the ways in which any concerns might be dealt with. So here, pretty basically, we've got a couple of uh, Chinese companies looking to buy um, businesses in the defense industry. Um, in both cases, uh, the, the government um, prohibited uh, the deals from taking place. 
uh, and in both cases the deal the deals were abandoned um, presumably on the basis that it was clear the government was not going to approve them. The Gardner Aerospace uh, Imp Cross decision is interesting in that notwithstanding the deal was abandoned, the government still uh, got undertakings from Gardner Aerospace, barring uh, any purchase of Imp Cross for 12 months and requiring notice of any discussions restarting in relation to that acquisition. Um, so that's that's unusual in terms of undertakings being given even though the deal itself didn't go through. Um, then a little bit less straightforward on the next slide, we have an example of uh, investments from uh, allied um, interests. So a JV of UK, US and Canadian interests uh, acquired Inmarsat, satellite company. Um, it's a contractor that has UK space uh, contracts with uh, UK space defense and civilian agencies. It was called in because it provides strategic services and holds sensitive information. Um, these, obviously, these are nationals of the UK and allied countries, so it's not it's not that they're hostile players. But the government was concerned uh, about the information that's held and and the importance of Inmarsat's operations. Um, so it uh, it imposed undertakings or agreed undertakings, um, saying that uh, the 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 new owner of Inmarsat would maintain its operations so it could still deliver on its UK government contracts, would report any material changes in operations, would protect sensitive information, including not allowing foreign nationals to be involved in decisions, material decisions in relation to that information, um, and required that half of the board of Inmarsat, including its chair, had to be security cleared UK nationals. Um, so that's that's an example of the sorts of things that might be put in place for deals where the acquirer doesn't necessarily raise a lot of risk, but the target is sufficiently risky that the government wants to put controls in place. And what's interesting is that uh, just recently it's been announced that Inmarsat is to be sold on again to Viasat, um, and I would imagine that that is a deal um, that that's not going to complete quickly enough to get in ahead of the 4th of January. And so that probably will be uh, one of the early big deals to be caught under the National Security and Investment Act. Um, and you've probably also seen in the news uh, that NVIDIA's planned acquisition of ARM, um, the government's intervened in that. Uh, and last week, the UK government instructed the CMA to carry out a phase two review because there's a combination of concerns about competition and national security. So, so that, that one continues to rumble on. Um, so uh, I've got uh, a, a couple of questions if we move on to those. Uh, one question is, does the supply of goods or services to persons mean actual people in terms of individuals, or does it mean entities such as company or government department? Um, so yeah, in, in legislation, persons will include both individuals and uh, legal persons such as companies and public authorities and that sort of thing. So, so that's the answer to that. Um, there's then a, a, a very good question about, is there a possibility of financial assistance in consequence of a final order where the call-in uh, related to a proposed acquisition of an asset, such as in an IP licensing situation? Um, the answer there is, is yes, because that goes back to the point I made about how the, the call-in power and mandatory notification and voluntary notification, these are all just different gateways into the same process. Um, and so a, a, a final order is, is kind of the outcome of that process. And at that stage, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter how you got into the process. So um, the financial assistance uh, possibility, that, that is there um, regardless of uh, whether it's a, a voluntary acquisition, a mandatory notification, or an own initiative call-in. Um, just one final question that I've got uh, is how this regime uh, will interact with other regulatory and approval regimes. Um, the government's produced guidance on that. There is a blog on the Brodie's website about that. Essentially, um, if something has to be notified under the National Security and Investment Act, then it has to be notified um, and you have to get it cleared. And the fact that you're also getting it notified under some other regime is not going to uh, save you from having to go through the national security and investment process. Um, there is a stated intention for them to try not to get in each other's way, um, but uh, ultimately um, some of what the government has been saying indicates that uh, in the event of any tension, the National Security and Investment um, Act regime will take precedence. Um, probably for fairly obvious reasons that national security is, is kind of the, the top ranked um, concern of government. Um, the final slide has my contact details, so if you want to get in touch uh, with anything in relation to uh, what we've been discussing, please do so. Um, 
I think when you leave, you will be asked to fill in a survey, uh, just five questions or so. If you could take just a little bit of time required to do that, that would be appreciated because it's always good for us um, to have those feedback, uh, have that feedback. Um, otherwise, you'll get a recording uh, and, this, and a copy of the slides um, of this uh, webinar in due course. Um, so if that prompts any questions or there was anything you didn't want to ask um, in real time, uh, then don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, this is an issue that will run and run. Um, so uh, I'm sure we will be doing more updates about it, um, both written and other webinars in the near future. So um, do stay tuned if it's something that you're interested in. Um, okay, I think that's us. Uh, thank you very much for your time and I hope to see you again.